says is that we actually need to pay for environmental services and we need to recognise how much they're actually worth. And at the moment we often don't. So oh, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that on a comp. I really would. Um, and I really love this quote too that um, what we're kind of aiming for is that society recognises, measures, manages and economically rewards responsible stewardship of its natural capital. And we're starting to move down that line with some of the work that we're doing, but we're probably a fair way off kind of getting where we need to get to. Now, does anyone, is anyone familiar with tea? Yeah. Um, Google it, it's worth a look. They do an awful lot of work on a global scale to try and encourage um, understanding of biodiversity values and benefits um, in, in, the, in the economy. And um, they have some really good, useful, educative kind of material. I won't go into much detail with this, but um, Jeremy kind of talked about auctions being uh, a market-based approach, but from a government perspective, and I work in Victorian government, um, there's a range of different kind of approaches that, or policy directions that government can take to try and change behaviour or get improvements or get the outcomes that they're after. So there's, there's the legislative approaches, and um, Jeremy mentioned um, offsets. So we actually have an offset market in DEPI, which is the native vegetation regulations and offsets in native vegetation. But also there's a whole stack of positive incentives that government can use too. And I must admit, I much prefer working in this space than working in that space. Mm -hmm. um, it's a much nicer way to deal with people. And conservation auctions from the sense of native vegetation and biodiversity and those kind of values is really just one aspect of positive incentives. But it's a very large um, component of our work. Um, but grants are also, significant option and we have very large grant programs such as Communities for Nature that have a slightly different target audience but also might um, get similar outcomes. And then there's the voluntary stuff like you guys walking in here for just a couple of cheeses and big beers and a you know a glass of wine and you know you're willing to do something without us necessarily having to pay you. So there's all of those options as well. And we know that everybody's different, not just um, I notice that everybody in terms of what it costs you to do stuff, um, the environmental services on your property are going to be different from site to site. There's going to be more value in some than there are in others. Um, the price that it, it costs to actually supply that service is different. Your skills to actually manage that, um, the resources that you have access to, all of your costs and the benefits to you are all very different. So when we're talking in a conservation auction perspective, we're dealing with a very um, vast, heterogeneous um, group of landowners. So they're not uniform. They all have different um, benefits and different costs, and we don't know what they are. So government as a buyer um, doesn't have that information. And this is where conservation market, markets are very valuable because they actually recognise the difference in the costs and the benefits of undertaking work. And they actually provide us with a way of ensuring that we get some investment efficiency. And particularly conservation tenders, and this is the area that I work in, um, through conservation tender we can actually able to identify low cost suppliers, we're able to target larger scale projects than what we could potentially, potentially do via grant programs. We have a longer term outlook because grants tend to be a one off, or one year kind of program. Um, and we can look at five, ten years permanent protection, ongoing kind of maintenance. Um, they attract a wider audience. Grants tend to go through land care networks and land care groups or community groups, but you tend to get um, a much broader range of, of landholder types. 
in the conservation options. And we're hoping to maximise the ecosystem services that we're actually procuring through the conservation process. So I thought I'd just um, give you a couple of examples from a government perspective. There's uh, bush tender has been around since I think it was 2001. And there's been 35,000 hectares of land that has been managed for remnant vegetation on private land for about the cost of about $17.5 million. And bush tender was one of the first auction programs that was ever run in Victoria. And a lot of the work was designed by Gary Stone, who um, used to be an economist for that department and now works in the Department of Treasury. Uh, we also have a huge number of um, catchment management authority programs and Luke's in the audience and I'll actually feature one of his projects later. And um, there's some really good experience across the CMAs running conservation options. So I think to date there's about seven to thirty auctions that have been run since about, about 2008 and around 50 million dollars put into private land conservation works as a result and then we've run three eco tender trials so i was a field officer in the first one which was around um, karanga marsh down the ecola geelong that way and we ran one in port phillip and um, one across in west skippy so Grand Mike projects finished last year and the Port Phillip ones have just finishing up and the West Gippie ones have got another couple of years to go. So we've had five year contracts <coughs> in those. And the difference between Eco Tender and some of the previous programs was um, that we we're actually testing a lot of our assumptions, our scientific um, methodologies, our tools. We're trying to create some robust systems to try and um, measure our outcomes via um, modelling tools. And we're also looking at multiple outcomes. So originally, uh, bush tender and a lot of the CMA options are about single biodiversity-focused programs. We're looking at multiple outcomes, so reduction in runoff, erosion, biodiversity values, all those kind of things. So we're testing quite a few things with these trials. Um, and I think it was about 1,700 hectares of work, I think, that we had on this. And we had very high permanent protection on the West Gippsland one, which was really interesting. That was considering that we had our major target audience with primary producers, we had a really good outcome in terms of having sites permanently protected. I think it was something like 70 sites. Um, these are just standard process requirements. And you can see when you apply these to other areas of um, incentives, but they're pretty important from a conservation option perspective. So. Um, your decisions and your judgments have to be defensible, they have to be fair, everyone has to be treated the same. So all of the information that you provide to landowners has to be exactly the same and they need to be able to go through the process in the same way. Um, you have to treat the information as confidential, so um, when a landowner puts in a bid for us, it's not revealed. Um, we, and part of that is to, is to make it free from interference and collusion and making sure that people aren't kind of gaining the process. So we protect privacy pretty severely um, to preserve the integrity and we have very strict probity requirements and auditing processes in place. Um, and the bids are concealed so nobody knows um, ever what the price is that the landowners um, offer. Uh, this is the standard process and this is Dave who is one of our land care officers who was involved in the West Gippsland, um, one of our West Gippsland programs. Hi Dave. <laughs> yeah, I should have been waiting there, you should yeah. <laughs> um, So the standard process is really to call for an expression of interest and um, different programs call for that in different ways. So some people might put advertisements in newspapers, um, send uh, direct mail out to landowners who they're targeting, um, so that all you know, pass information via Landcare Networks so that people can participate in the auction. It's nearly always a closing date, so it kind of encourages people to get their application in because that way they may or may um, not get assessed. Um, we have a site tour, so as a field officer you would go out and talk to the landowner about what they're interested in, they would show you the sites that they, they want to do work on, and you would discuss with them the possible actions that they can do, you know, whether they can fence it out, they can do some weed controls and external control, all those kind of things. And we just use handheld computers to collect some information on the site. So it's a very basic data around um, what's the quality of the site, you know, the vegetation quality, um, how big the site, the site is, all those kind of things. 
Um, the landowner chooses the land management actions that they want to undertake. And Jerry mentioned before about the difference between public and private benefits. So from, a, um, from an auction perspective, what we're interested in is landowners getting paid for work that is beyond their existing obligations. So we would expect them, for example, to control rabbits or particular weeds because um, there's acts and regulations that require them to do so. But if they, um, if they want to eradicate a weed and they're not actually obligated to do under law, then that's considered you know, um, above and beyond the standard that's required. So we take that into account when we're actually assessing the site. Um, a management plan is produced for their sites, which includes a map um, and activities on a yearly basis, what's required to kind of manage that site to improve its, its quality. And then the landowner uses that to, to um, kind of develop the basis for their bids. They can use those actions to cost out the amount of work that's required um, how much time they might um, you know, do the labour themselves, they might get contractors in, and then it's up to them to decide how much they actually want to be, how much are they willing to, or how much do they actually require to have a contract for five years or ten years or whatever it is to manage that site for those improvements. Um, so they enter the competitive tender process, and usually what happens is a, um, a package is sent out to them, they um, sign a form that says what their price is seal it and send it back to us in the kind of all opened community process. Sure. How do they know what to think? That's How a tricky one. That's probably yeah. the hardest part of the whole conservation auction. Um, and you'll find that primary producers tend to have not any problem with being able to do that because they're used to costing things. Um, but when you're dealing with hobby farmers and smaller acreage, people do really struggle. And we tend to give them guidelines around, think about your fencing costs, think about how much weed work you might want to do, Think about what the flush of weeds might be when you've actually got rid of that weed or you've taken the stock off. Yeah. So we kind of give them a list of things to think about, but there's other things like uh, their opportunity costs that we're not aware of. So they'll look at some things and say, well, I actually might want to wear the cost of that, um, but that's just too much, I can't afford that, mm -hmm. I'm going to put that in my bid. So at the end of the day, we're not. Um, the cost may not necessarily reflect the actual cost of the site. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know just anecdotally, um, some of our landowners telling us, oh, you know, fencing was twelve dollars a meter, but I actually kind of only costed it seven dollars a meter, you know, that kind of thing. So it's all of that, and because it's a competitive process, a lot of them will actually lower their their price because they don't want to miss out on the funds because it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to warn them against actually undercosting their bid because you don't want them to fall out of the process later on when you sign them off to a contract mm -hmm. because they just can't um, manage it. So it, it is probably the hardest <coughs> part of the whole process. But um, we have actually done some really good work um, in that area, so we might want to talk to you guys about that later. Um, I just wanted to mention one of the things that we, we look at when we're out in the field is the current condition of the site. And this is quite important for our metric and the way that we actually score um, sites. So what we're interested in is, is um, getting a landowner to work out how much of change they're going to make on, on their site. So we kind of consider the site at a certain point and say, if they do nothing, it's probably going to decline. If they do something, it's going to improve a little bit. And if they do something more, it's going to improve the quality of the site. So that's kind of taken into consideration. So you know, they might take off the stock and fence it. So um, that results in a certain amount of change. And we use the current condition along with some modelling data to try and estimate how much change we think will result um, from the particular actions that we've chosen. Um, and Jeremy mentioned the environmental benefit scores or the environmental benefit that we're trying to work out or trying to gain from doing this process. So we take things like the current condition, the landowner actions, and then the preference, preferences of your investors. So what do we prefer more? If we have two sites that are exactly the same in quality, how do we distinguish which one is, is better value? This one might be more connected to remnant vegetation. This one might ha have higher threatened species. So you use those preferences to decide um, what you value the most. So all of those three things are taken into consideration when we design our, our metric. Um, so then from that, we're calculating the change that we expect and we're also thinking about the significance of the site in terms of our preferences. 
and that gives us an environmental benefit score. So we use um, a modelling platform called Ensim um, that does all of this work for us, and the mathematics kind of sit in the background. Um, so the land and cost divided by the benefit gives us an ability to be able to rank all of those um, bids against each other. And that's the, the same curve that Jeremy was talking about. So ours is, this is kind of quite typical of what we would get. We get a, the benefit, um, and what we do have in DEPI is we have um, a mathematical algorithm which actually allows us to separate out the higher value, lower cost bids from the lower value, higher cost bids. And that actually gives us a point for panels who are trying to decide where they fund to, um, what's actually worth funding and what's not worth funding. So that's actually a very useful um, tool that we need. Um, the other quick um, program I want to mention was the Victorian Environmental Partnerships Program that I'm part of. And we have eight of 10 CMAs who have been involved in this program. And again, Luke can talk to this one. And I've actually got a couple of lovely photos of his from his work. Um, but this, this was actually a competitive process right from the start in that CMAs had put in a proposal um, and then they got a certain amount of funding to do that work. So some CMAs got all of the funding that they requested and some CMAs got less, but all of the process was basically running conservation auctions. Um, and the Wimmera Glenelg area I think is of particular interest and I've picked this one because one, I know the media's gone out and the minister's released the information so I can talk about it. <laughs> um, and two, it's just an interesting one from the point of view of it's a, it's a biodiversity hotspot and it's well targeted. Um, from, perspective, from our perspective, because we were asking CMAs to target um, high value native vegetation in the first place, um, so that we could get, so we could increase the extent and quality of native vegetation, which was the focus of, of this program. So this is one of the larger programs, um, which was another round, I guess, of the best standard habitat tender. Um, and a very targeted approach in that um, the CMAs could choose, uh, they pretty well all have a fairly standard process, but for example, the expression of interest process, um, Wimmera and Glenelg Hopkins um, targeted direct mail, um, other CMAs use you know, external media to target their owner, landowners. But this one was probably the most efficient in terms of you know, cost and target audience. And as a result of that, there's over 5,600 hectares of remnant vegetation that will be managed in the next five years, um, and a lot of that high value. 154 hectares of revegetation work, um, and that will involve putting the, the major components of the overstory and the understory um, back so that in, in densities that you'd hope will mimic the, um, the stable vegetation community. And six covenants on, I think it's over 2,000 hectares, I think. Um, so that's an incredible um, figure. Um, so that means permanent protection, ongoing permanent protection goes on title, and that means every um, subsequent landowner is actually bound to protect those sites. So that's pretty that was six out of how many? Uh, six covenants out of. Was it 50 in the 55 landowners? 45 sites. 45 sites. That's, that's pretty good. Um, and the only reason, I just wanted to take this one on to the end because, um, so we're just kind of just working through all of that work now in terms of what's all the results from the, um, the auctions. The, the contracts have only just been signed in October with landowners, so the next five years is where all the work's going to be done. But on top of that, um, Deputy is doing some work in the background to um, take the data from the Victorian Environmental Partnerships Program and draft up a set of um, mock accounts for um, environmental accounts that feed into um, the economic accounts. So you'll have land accounts, ecosystem asset accounts, service flow accounts on water and carbon, um, as well as just looking at straight expenditure and, um, and protection accounts. So that work's kind of happening in the background and this is one of the things that's coming out of the program that we've done because the, um, the Victorian Environmental Partnership Program, while we've run a lot of conservation options across the state before, we've never actually won, run one process that's consistent across the whole state before. So this was kind of our first opportunity to do that. 
Um, so that's that's a really good outcome in itself. And then there's also some work that's starting in November to kind of um, by Upper Isle Institute is looking at ground truthing um, what actions landowners are undertaking on the ground and comparing that against um, control sites that aren't managed. So you're looking at sites that have management against sites that have no action and then comparing that back to our models um, to see that we're actually, all that our work is actually making sense. So that's where we're at. So I've kind of rushed through that, but I hope that's. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll, we'll open up um, questions. So um, we.